Hi, I'm Bill Kinney, and this is my fifth video on doing real analysis proofs. In videos number three and four, which I will provide links to here, I prove some important fundamental inequalities using mathematical induction, actually, in both videos three and four, although with video four I did a little extra thing where I used something more advanced called the mean value theorem, just to show you you could do it with that method as well. Here I want to go back to basics and not use the mean value theorem, but I also want to avoid induction. I want to use facts from those previous videos, videos number three and four, and within the present videos to help me do three parts, parts A, B, and C in this problem, which I think I can do pretty quickly. But again, you should watch videos three and four before you watch this one because I'm going to make use of those facts. Inequalities kind of form the lifeblood of real analysis and complex analysis for that matter. They are the tools that you need to prove lots of different things, to be sure about things, facts in real analysis and complex analysis. So let's start with the proof of part A. It's going to turn out to prove part A, I'm going to avoid induction. I'm going to use the fact of the main fact from video number four, the previous one. It's actually got a name. I didn't use this name in that video. It's called Bernoulli's inequality, and you could look that up if you like. It says that if you've got a real number, x that's bigger than negative 1, and n happens to be a positive integer, an element of the natural numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc., that that implies that 1 plus x quantity to the n power is bigger than or equal to 1 plus n times x. I'm going to make use of that here. I proved that with induction. I will make use of it in part a of this problem and avoid induction. So let's finish this proof here. Let's go ahead and start it by writing, rewriting the assumptions. Let c be bigger than 1. It's implicit in writing that, really, that c is a real number. And let's let n be an arbitrary natural number. If I can show this inequality right here is true for an arbitrary natural number, then it will be true for all natural numbers. And I, I can avoid an induction in this problem. All right. Um, I would like to apply Bernoulli's inequality. You see there's a commonality here. You see a c to the n and a 1 plus x to the n. Maybe c should equal 1 plus x. It's not obvious that that's going to work. I would encourage you to get some scratch paper, pause the video, and try it on your own and see if you can make it work based on letting c equal 1 plus x, or said another way, let x equal c minus 1. If we're going to apply Bernoulli's inequality, we better verify that this is bigger than negative 1, but that's pretty obvious based on the fact that I'm assuming c is bigger than 1. This is bigger than 1 minus 1, which is 0, which is bigger than negative 1. So we may apply Bernoulli's inequality with this x and that n. I can say by Bernoulli's inequality, c to the n which is the same as 1 plus x to the n, since x is c minus 1, is greater than or equal to 1 plus n times x. How is that related to c itself? It doesn't equal c. c is 1 plus x. You might be tempted to right away write down that this is greater than or equal to 1 plus x, but wait a minute. You shouldn't rush too fast. You should say why. It is important that n be a positive integer, since n is a positive integer, and in fact it's important that x is not only bigger than negative 1, it's also important that x is positive, bigger than 0. Those two facts imply that 1 plus n times x is greater than or equal to 1 plus x, which equals c. Therefore, c to the n is greater than or equal to c, and we're done. Okay, we were able to prove that without induction. By the way, it's also worth noting here that both of these things are bigger than 1. That was definitely true because I'm assuming c is bigger than 1. And the heart of the content here is that if you've got a number bigger than 1, like 1.1 or 2 or 7 or a million, you raise it to a positive integer power, say bigger than 1, you get something bigger than you started with. This actually can be a strict uh, inequality if n is bigger than 1. All right, so now we're on to proof of part B.
you've got, once again, a real number bigger than 1. But now you've got two positive integers with m being greater than or equal to n. I'd like to prove this fact is true. And once again, by the fact that c is bigger than 1, these, term, it turns out, would also be both bigger than 1. When you raise c, a number bigger than 1, to a higher power, you get something greater than raising it to a lower power. In fact, this would be a strict inequality if m were strictly greater than n. All right, so what should we do here? You might wonder, can we use part a to do this problem? I'd encourage you to try some scratch work to see if you can figure out how to use part a, because it turns out you can. Although, we probably should think about a separate simple case, a trivial case first. If m happened to equal n, then the conclusion we're after here is trivially true. c to the m would equal c to the n, and any number is greater than or equal to itself. And we'd be done with that case. What about the other case if m is strictly greater than n? And why am I doing a separate case here? Why do I need two cases? Well, when m is strictly greater than n, then I can say m minus n is strictly greater than 0. It does not equal 0, and I will need that to apply part a, because I'm assuming that power in part a is strictly positive. m minus n is a natural number, so by part a, it follows that what? Okay, I guess I'm giving you a hint about what I'm going to try here. I'm going to raise c to the m minus n power. Now, if that was not clear to try, that would be something you'd want to think about. And maybe even want to pause the video right now and think about it. Why is this something good to think about when I'm trying to prove this fact here? By part a, I can say this is greater than or equal to c, which does happen to be bigger than 1. Again, I'm assuming c is bigger than 1. Therefore, c to the m minus n is the same as c to the m divided by c to the n. You may use properties of exponents here, eminent or natural numbers. This is bigger than 1, and these things are both positive, therefore I can multiply both sides by c to the n and get this fact here. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is bigger than 1, which is positive. I, I am dealing with positive quantities here. I essentially get this inequality. This inequality would follow from this one. So c to the m is greater than or equal to c to the n. I proved something a little stronger, but that's fine. I proved it in both cases. I'm done. That's the end of part b. Now we're on to part c. Let's c be a real number between 0 and 1. And once again, m and n are two positive integers with m greater than or equal to n. Do I need two cases here? Turns out I don't. I'm going to use part b as part of what I do. You might scratch your head and wonder, how could you use part b since c is not bigger than 1? Well, here's a little hint. 1 over c would be bigger than 1. You go think about it now. I'm also going to use my vi main fact from video number 3. Let me write that over here. Video number 3 fact. You could go back and watch video number 3. Let me just state the main fact in that video. I wrote it like this. If a and b are real numbers with 0 less than a less than or equal to b, then 0 would be less than 1 over b would be less than or equal to 1 over a. This is definitely true. I think I, think I actually wrote, just wrote a less than or equal to there, but a strict less than would be fine as well. And in fact, I didn't prove this, but if this is a strict inequality, if this happened to be just a less than, then this would be a less than as well. Okay, I didn't prove that part of it, but it's, it's an easy modification of what I did. So I will use either of those facts. How could we use that here? So c is between 0 and 1. Essentially, I can use video number 3 fact to say that 1 is less than 1 over c. By... I'll just say by video number three, when I really mean video number three fact. 
I can say 0 is less than 1 over 1 is less than 1 over C, and that equals 1. So I may now apply part B to 1 over C instead of C. Therefore, by part B, I can say that um, looking at part B here with 1 over C in place of C, 1 over C raised to the m power is greater than or equal to 1 over C raised to the n power. And I could note these are both greater than 1. Um, I'm assuming you know how to raise fractions to powers, and 1 to any power is 1. Therefore, 1 over c to the n is greater than or equal to 1 over c to the n, which is bigger than 1. And now I should use video 3 fact again. I should take reciprocals here and switch the direction of the inequalities. Let's go ahead and do that. Lots of therefores here. Therefore, I could write um, c to the m, or well, let me write it this way first. 1 over 1 over c to the m is less than or equal to 1 over 1 over c to the n is less than 1 over 1, which is 1 by video number 3. But what are these things? These things are c to the m and c to the n. And these things are all positive. Okay, I did have that from video number 3 as well. Thus, 0 is less than c to the m is less than or equal to c to the m is less than 1, which is what I wanted to show. Right there. Okay. So, three inequalities that I hope make intuitive sense to you proved using previous facts. Um, but you might try, especially with part A, for example, try, try it with induction as well.